zero and I'm doing the half shadow half light thing not because I need to replace a lamp but because I'm doing a detective movie this week that's right I'm returning back once again into the realm of film and not just any film this time I'm taking a look at a film starring one of the most famous American actors of all time John Wayne and not a Western either no I'm taking a look and the detective film, McHugh. However, before I talk about this film, I need to info dump a little on a film that came before, Dirty Harry. Dirty Harry was, according to the writers, originally written for John Wayne, who the film's writers had worked with before on the movie Big Jake. He was not the first person who was offered the role, though, by the director. That went to Frank Sinatra, who turned the role down as he could not lift the film's signature 357 Magnum and fire it because of an injury he sustained on the set of The Manchurian Candidate. While that film also involved the hunt for a serial killer in terms of that version of the film, it was set in New York instead of San Francisco. However, John Wayne turned Dirty Harry down, reportedly stating that the film's violence was unjustified and glorified. In Wayne's biography, John Wayne, the man behind the myth, Wayne gave author Michael Munn slightly different reasons. Particularly, he mentioned he played characters like Larry Callahan, the loner who plays by his own rules, for much of his career, and he felt like he played the character too much. He also didn't like the fact that he was basically, in his eyes, taking Frank Sinatra's table scraps. Now, I don't know if the difference for the reasons was due to Wayne's memory over time, or attempting to reconcile his justifications for turning down this role with choosing to make McHugh. In any case, Dirty Harry made massive amounts of money at the box office, and redefined the loose cannon cop who gets results, at least in terms of cinema. Where once the role was defined by Gene Hackman and Popeye Doyle from The French Connection, now the role was defined by Clint Eastwood, and Harry Callahan. This led Wayne to have some second thoughts about having turned down the role. Maybe it was due to the way how the film changed that type of character, as I mentioned before. Maybe it was due to the fact that the film made about, oh, $36 million at the box office. That's 1970s dollars. Adjusted for inflation on your own. I'll probably put a little caption down here with the adjusted figures. Um... In any case, the next time a script for a film of this type made its way across Wayne's desk or wherever he reads his script, read his scripts at, he took it. That film was McHugh. Now, when it comes to reviewing mystery films, there's one question you have to ask as a reviewer, as a critic, before you start talking about it. Do you spoil? Do you spoil the solution? On the one hand, Part of the fun, a big chunk of the fun, is going through the, the film, not knowing where it's going, trying to anticipate the solution, and then finding out if you're right or not. This also gives you the added advantage of then, once you've seen it or read it once before, you can go back through it again, and now that you know what the solution is, look for the breadcrumbs and see if they're there or not. Now, if the solution's a cheat, if it's something like, for example, the original novel of um, Murder on the Orient Express, or really a lot of other stuff by Agatha Christie, it hurts the overall quality of the film, and it's important to bring that up. But, if it's a satisfying conclusion, if you feel that you had a chance of solving it, maybe you got it wrong, or even better, if you managed to get it right, then ruining it by spoiling the twist hurts the film. So, I'm going to kind of try to avoid spoiling it here, although I'm going to say the solution of this film really makes no Goram sense. None at all. The film opens with the shootings of two police officers, one on his beat, 
the other at the impound yard by another police officer, Stan Boyle, who was in turn shot by his employer and left in a coma. Around the same time, Lon McHugh, a.k.a. McHugh, played by John Wayne, is attacked by an assassin who was apparently not informed that he was being sent to kill John Wayne and thus ends up getting shot by Wayne instead. The chief, Captain Kosterman, believes these shootings are being done by street militants, which is apparently 70s cop slang for damn dirty hippies. McHugh has another idea. He thinks the, other, the local drug kingpin, Santiago, is responsible. So this leads me to the first big problem with this film. While the film is set in Seattle, and it's clearly set in Seattle, from the very overcast skies which permeate the film, occasional glimmers of blue, and of course you have all the various landmarks from Seattle, although I don't believe the Space Needle was built at the time of this filming, it doesn't use Seattle. You could take this film's plot and pop it into any other city in the country and change nothing about this film and it still works. With the French Connection... Because, well, New York City is an Atlantic port city. The film's plot, I mean, also because it's based on real events, it felt like a New York story. Um, it fit in nicely in New York. Admittedly, most stories fit in nicely in New York, or anywhere else for that matter. With Dirty Harry, because the Scorpio killer in the film was based on the Zodiac serial killer who operated in San Francisco you had the sense of we are connected and this is, this is a San Francisco story in a fashion beyond just, oh, look, there's the Golden Gate Bridge. Oh, look, we're at the Presidio. It's actually one of the reasons I like the Inspector uh, Morse novels and to a certain degree also the television series is it's a murder mystery series, a mystery series set in a college town and takes advantage of the fact that you're in a college town where you have the locals who live there and will spend most, if not all, of their lives there, and then you have all these young people who are basically floating through the town for four to eight years, maybe longer if they're going for a doctorate, and then leaving, and possibly never coming back again. And that's a dynamic which makes for interesting stories, and which the Inspector Morris novels take advantage of. This film really doesn't. The drug smuggler here is your standard, always oh, a Latin American drug smuggler. We're going to give him a generic Latin American name because he's smuggling drugs. And we could plop him in, basically, we could put him in Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Diego, anywhere in California. You could plop him in, maybe not some in, in Texas, maybe even in seven, 1970s Florida, but... That's it. I mean, that's it. You, you can put him anywhere. On the other hand, this is Seattle. It has, in addition to all the other ethnic groups that live there, it has a very strong Haitian population of Japanese and Chinese immigrants. And with it comes Japanese and Chinese organized crime. While I realize that this could very much easily lead to racial stereotypes, honestly... <clears throat> There could be a way to include a, have the bad guy, the, the main mob boss, be Yakuza, be Triads or Tongs, something like that. Something to make it say, we are in, on the West Coast now, we are in a town which has a major Asian population and is an important part of the, of the city as far as its, its immigrant population. And to take advantage of the fact that we are in Seattle not just in a major city that has crime. One other really good example about this, as far as for other works of fiction that really work with, you know, the city that they're set in, um, I would recommend checking out Greg Rucka's Stumptown graphic novel series. And, yes, I'm focusing on Portland here because I live in Portland. Also recommend, if you're not watching Grimm, watch Grimm. But, so there's that problem. Anyway, McHugh quietly investigates Santiago, trying to gather evidence to prove his guilt, until he learns that Boyle has died in the hospital, at which point McHugh takes this rather well. One less detective to worry about. 
Yeah, one less detective to worry about. I got a message from Patty Samuels. He's sorry he blew it on McHugh, but he rang it up with Boyle. See that widow a Japanese tea set. Who also, you fool? That's who. Patty Samuels made a deathbed statement. You put up ten grand to go bang on Boyle and me. You're insane! Yeah. What's the matter? No confession? Even under arrest? In response to this, Kosterman tries to put McHugh behind a desk. So instead, McHugh resigns from the force so he can become a PI and finish the investigation on his own, though without the support of law enforcement, and thus the powers that come with the badge. He also goes and gets himself a brand spanking new Ingram Mac 10, making its feature film debut. Now I have to talk about the actual mystery of the film, such as it is, and how the evidence is presented to the audience and how the solution works and try to do this without do giving spoilers and not ruining the film in case you do decide you want to see this because you're a Wayne, John Wayne fan or you're a fan of this genre of film. One of the traits of the mystery film and mystery novel and so forth and so on, if you haven't picked this up before, is the idea of the red herring. This comes up whether you are a cozy, um, like with Agatha Christie, whether you're a police procedural, like Ed McBain, if you're a hard-boiled private detective story, like the works of Dashiell Hammett, you have to have an, you have to have some red herrings in there. There have to be someone who is a suspect, who looks like a good suspect, and then something happens where you are just where you basically go, oh no, it can't be them. Or on the other hand. It is somewhat, something happens to eliminate the real suspect and shift the blame over to someone else. And I mean, this is kind of a spoiler, but I'm being vague enough that hopefully you're not, it's not, not giving everything away. McHugh has no red herrings. What you see as far as the first suspect, as far as the first real suspect you get, kind of is who it is. There is no one who, to distract the audience, say, oh, it could be them. No real person for that. Or there is no person in the film where you first, when you come in and going, oh, it's got to be this guy, and it turns out, no, it wasn't them. I was, we, we were distracted. It said it uses a red herring to eliminate the main suspect, or, or it uses some, some a false lead in the evidence, rather, to eliminate the main suspect without having any other suspects to replace them, leaving you confused about who it could be, and then have that suspect reintroduced later. That's not good mystery writing. That is very, very bad mystery writing. It baits and switches the audience poorly, and it doesn't really give the audience a chance to put the pieces together in their own right. Because they're thinking, oh, they're going to drop another shoe. They had eliminated this character, which means they're going to introduce someone later, who's the real person. So i got to be looking for him. So now I have to go reevaluate everyone else to see who this could be. Only there is no other shoe. They just dropped the first shoe again. It's a terrible analogy, but it's the movie that, this is a movie that lends itself to terrible analogies. Now, in spite of the flaws with the script, the acting performances and direction are quite good. While the film's script underuses the city of Seattle, director John Sturges makes up for it by providing plenty of excellent shots of the city to try and compensate and try to make the, film, the city the character that it should be. Wayne also tries to do a good job with the film, recognizing that if he wants to compete with Eastwood and his portrayal of Harry Callahan, he would have to bring his A-game, which he did. Additionally, one good thing I'll say about the script is that it does try and make up and account for the fact that 
Wayne is a much older actor than Eastwood was at this time, and accounts for it by giving a brief subplot with McHugh and his uh, ex-wife and their daughter, who his wife has custody of, and her new husband, who is, well, loaded. It doesn't do much to forward the plot. In fact, it does nothing really to forward the plot. But it does develop Ka uh, McHugh as a character, and thus really gives him a, a bit more sense of depth than, say, Harry Callahan had in that film. Additionally, Al Dettieri, who you may remember from The Godfather, does a very good job in one of his last films before his death in 1975. Um, in this film, he plays Santiago, the somewhat Latin American, possibly slightly Italian, organized crime boss who does the drug smuggling. I also need to give some praise to Diana Muldurer, and I apologize for mispronouncing the name, as Boyle's wife, Lois. She's stuck with a character who is, on the one hand, important to the story, but on the other hand, does very, very little in this story, and she managed to make the character stick out and feel somewhat memorable, as opposed to many other members of the cast. I cannot recommend this movie you know, on its own merits. If you want to know what John Wayne as Dirty Harry might have looked like, that's a good reason to watch this movie. If you're a fan of John Wayne, who has never heard of this film before, and as a completionist, you want to watch this film, that's a reason to watch this film. The performance, if you want to see the like one of the last films starring Al Terry, watch this film for that reason. Don't watch this film because you're expecting a good cop movie, because you're expecting a good detective movie, because you're not going to get it. So, I mean, maybe later I'll look at Wayne's other loose cannon cop film, Brannigan, to see if that fares better. But this film is not worth getting. So, next week, well, this is I plan for this to be at the port ready by the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, which is where I will be. Um, hopefully, I will see some of you there. Rather, you will see some of me and say hello and thank me for doing for doing the show or whatever. But by next week. I will be stepping once again into the realm of retro gaming, where once I ventured into this territory on my text reviews and my blog back in the day, it's time to go back. As I am going to take a look and basically chrono game my way through the history of Nintendo Power Magazine and its earlier version, the Nintendo Fun Club. So, until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching.